why don't we just start from the beginning? Um, where, 1975, where, where, where are you? I was 23 years old. I was a new reporter at the Baltimore News American. And my job was to come into the newsroom every morning at 4 o'clock and call every police barracks in the state of Maryland and ask them if anything happened overnight. And 99.99999% of the time, the answer was no, even if something had <laughs> happened overnight. <laughs> but on uh, March 26th of 1975, I called the uh, Montgomery County Police Barracks. I think it was in Wheaton, Maryland. And they said these two little girls had gone missing and that everybody was you know, looking for them. Uh, so it was an afternoon newspaper. And the idea was that if there, something was going on, I could go there immediately and possibly get a story in the paper later in the day. So I drove down there and I ended up spending two weeks covering this tragic disappearance. Which was a uh, national story? Well, in those days, no. Uh. Um, this is for you too young, Nick. Uh, but <laughs> it, it, in those days, without the internet and without cable TV, it was a very huge regional story. It was in all the newspapers, radio, and TV stations in Virginia, Baltimore, Washington, any of you in the audience here who are old enough to to remember. I mean, I, anyone from this area, if you say the Lions Sisters, they know immediately what we're talking about. So it was huge, but it was huge for its time, yeah. you know, just yeah. locally. Yeah. The um, So you spent two weeks... You're filing daily, every other day. I mean, is, is it, it's enough. There's enough. There's enough interest that that you're you're filing on a daily basis at this point. Like, what's yeah. the? What's I mean, the... I, I John and Mary Lyon, who realized uh, you know the importance of publicity yeah. in getting the word out that the girls were missing, opened up their home to reporters like myself who hung around and asked stupid questions, uh, and they were gracious as could be, and you know talked to everybody. And then I also spent time, obviously, with the detectives who were frantically following up on hundreds of leads and and there were searches going on and, and you know every abandoned building and empty lot and uh, so there was a lot to cover in those first uh, few days and weeks but of course hope began to fade yeah. uh, over time and you know the tragic end to this story was that there were no answers you know that uh, no one knew uh, what happened to these girls. And I think, you know, that experience for me left me kind of haunted by this story for the rest of my life. I was going to say, did it, did it, was there a, did you go into work one day and the, your editor just said, I think we're done with this. There's, there's nothing there. Well, what was the, what was the break? How did you sort of fade away? From I think it, I think it gradually, uh, you know, they just said you, you should come back at a certain point. And every time, even over the next few years, every time there was any wrinkle that developed in the Lion case, they would send me out to write a story about it. So I became sort of the the Lion Sisters reporter at mm. the paper. Uh, but then over time, obviously, you uh, there is no news, yeah. nothing is happening, and that was where it stayed. Uh, and, you know, many many years later, when you say when you say it, again. it haunted you, um, you had children at that point? Not at that point, no. And you know, in fact, when I look back on it, I'm actually a little ashamed that. At age 23, I was so excited that I was writing front page stories. To me, this was like the biggest story, you know, that I had ever covered. And and yet, at the same time, I'm living alongside these people who have suffered this unmentionable, unspeakable tragedy in their lives. And so I ended up feeling really kind of torn about the work I was doing and how I felt about it. And it really shaped me, I think, in... For a lot of the work that I did, it certainly made me more inclined to try to put myself in the shoes of the people I was writing about and, and to have a sense of what was happening as real and, and important and not just, you know, a big story for me. Because in some ways, sort of getting people to relive traumatic experiences has become your calling card. I mean, the, I, these I years, guess, these, these, these not, 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 not traumatic necessarily uh, in a, in a necessarily negative way, but in all the, in many of the books that followed, I mean, massive impactful events that, you know, you're going back. So I was just wondering, were there, were there, besides the empathy, were there uh, other sort of journalistic lessons that you'd taken away or, or oh, yeah. Clues? I mean, because the story was covered so widely, most of what you heard on the radio or saw on TV was being reported by people 
who were not themselves actually doing reporting, yeah. which has become basically the way the world runs now. Yeah. Uh, but I learned the value of being there and of meeting the people who are directly involved in the story, which is difficult sometimes, uh, but it's also invaluable in developing a real sense of what's happening and who the people are at the middle of it and you know what the significance of the story is. So the case sort of fades away for, for decades. How does it how does how does how does the case come back and then how does it come back on how does it come back into in, in your onto your desk? Well, I hadn't thought about it other than, you know, being haunted by it. I mean, I ended up having five children of my own. I now have two granddaughters and and I think if you've been close to people who've experienced a tragedy like this in their lives, it makes you acutely aware of the danger, even though it's an infinitesimal chance. Uh, I probably was more paranoid as a parent as a result. Uh, so it was always in my mind. And I think the fact that there were never any answers to this uh, made it kind of a, a story that didn't end, you know. And I was working on my last book, uh, Huey, 1968, in 2015 when I read an item in the Washington Post saying that the Montgomery County Police were naming a suspect in the Lion Sisters case. So that was the first I became aware of it again. I remember my sister who lives in Ellicott City uh, texted me and said, Mark, you should look up the story. The police have, you know, got a lead in the lion system. My brothers and sisters follow all my stories. Yeah. And uh, I wrote back to her that I would do something about it. So I called and I spoke to Darren Frank, uh, Captain Darren Frank, who um, uh, I think, you know, things have changed for me. You know, back back in the old days when I would call from the News American and ask the police what happened, they would Somebody say... Somebody take the call, it's they, bound. they would say nothing. <laughs> now it's like, really, Mark Bond? And I say, yeah, yeah. I covered that story a long time ago. And so he said, well, come on down. I'll introduce you to uh, the detectives who worked the case. Two of whom, by the way, are here tonight. Mark Janney and Katie Leggett were two of the detectives who <laughs> conducted this investigation. And so, you know, he, uh, Captain Frank just was very generous in inviting me to come down, meeting the detectives who conducted this amazing investigation. And in talking to them, you know, I started to learn more about what happened, and I thought this would make a really amazing story. Were at at that point when when uh, when Lloyd had been uh, named in the press, had he? Where was the case? Had he was were they trying to smoke him out at that point, or was was, was there had he been charged? I think actually, Martin and Katie could probably answer that better than me. But it, I think they weren't by any means finished. But they, they were further along than the story indicated. Lloyd, at that point, was more than just a person of interest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, at that point, really strongly suspected that he was the kidnapper and killer. Was he a familiar name? Did you remember him from the... No, I mean, the, the um, I know his name had never come up yeah. in, in 1975. But what was really interesting, and the reason why he surfaced again 30-some years later, is that when he was 18 years old... Back when this happened, he went to the back to the Wheaton Plaza Mall and was ultimately picked up by the police telling them a story, telling them that he had witnessed these girls being led from the mall by a kidnapper. And what really attracted their interest to Lloyd Welsh was the fact that he described the kidnapper as walking with a limp. And the suspect that they had zeroed in on uh, who they, especially Chris Homrock, who was the head of this uh, cold case team, felt very strongly was the person who had done this was a guy named Ray Molesky who walked with a limp. So they decided, well, we have to find this Lloyd Welsh because here we have potentially a witness, an eyewitness to the kidnapping. Yeah. And then the story took another turn. Which, which, I mean, there's so many questions that you sort of dabble with in the, in the final few pages about, about the psychology of, of, of Lloyd Welch. I mean, I just, I, what I can't figure out is, you know, criminal mastermind or absolute idiot. Like, <laughs> and <laughs> wannabe cr criminal mastermind. Uh, right. But yeah, I mean, if Lloyd did this to himself, I mean, apart, quite apart from the horrible crime that was committed, the fact that he, went to the police to tell a story when he was 18 years old is the only reason he ever would have come to their attention. 
And he told lies way back in 1970. He just made up this story, which he ultimately admitted even back in 1975 that he had made up after he flunked a lie detector test. Um, and then when that old statement prompted the department to take an interest in him again, he did not stop talking for right. like a year and a half. And if at any point he had shut up, he would not have ended up being convicted of murder and kidnapping. So he is, he thinks he's a lot cleverer than he is. Uh, he certainly thought he could outwit the detectives who were uh, interrogating him, uh, and he was wrong. You know, it, it reminds me, uh, I was just listening to um, an interview with Robert Caro, uh, and, and he writes S-U on the top of all of his uh, interview pages as he's doing interviews, which means shut up. And so, you know, and I think it's a great piece of journalistic and investigator advice, just stop talking and let the subject walk all over their own right. feet. I think I, I quote in the beginning of the book uh, a, a, a line from Raymond Carver. It says, it's like certain people who you box, you just box them and they'll eventually beat themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let them box and they'll beat themselves. Yeah. So that's this, that's what this was. Um, the In some ways the book is, is in, and you, you phrase it as such as well, I mean, it sort of is an anatomy of an extended interrogation session, an extended interview session. Right. You've been doing this for a long, long time. Were there tactics that were used by the detectives uh, that you, I mean, w w what did you sort of glean? What, what were your takeaways as you read through all those transcripts and watched all those interviews? Were there, what were the elements that you thought, wow, like that, how, how did how did they just pull that off? How did they, you know, wrench that piece of information from him? Really what I was mostly struck by is the dogged determination to keep at Lloyd Welsh, who, I mean, I know how hard it is. One of the reasons I find interviewing and interrogating so interesting is that's what I do and have been doing my whole life. And I've written about interrogations in the past for The Atlantic. It's a subject that really interests me. And I think, to be honest, I probably would never have gone back and written a book or anything about the Lyon case if it were not for the fact that this entire investigation is built upon this extended interrogation. And so I remember asking uh, Mark and Katie and the other detectives who were involved, um, did you keep, like, do you have transcripts of these interview sessions? And they said, we've got video. Mm. And so when I knew that I could watch 70 plus hours of this interrogation, I could watch them do what they did with him. And it's amazing, and I think partly amazing because unlike in a movie, or um, maybe a crime novel where the expert interrogator shows up and he knows or she knows exactly how to handle the situation or knows how to get information from somebody. I really think that Mark and Katie and Dave and Chris had to feel their way into this and they made mistakes. Uh, they, they planned how to approach Lloyd. Uh, they came up with interesting strategies. Katie at one point constructed a diary that invented a diary that didn't exist, which turned out to be really effective in shaking up Lloyd and getting him to tell him something new. But they're interviewing a person who is a con compulsive liar and who has every reason in the world not to reveal the truth and who is doing his level best to mislead them all, all the way through, even all the way up to the end. Lloyd never actually did tell the truth about anything. But what you find, what they found, is that as he reinvents his story, as Dave Davis put it, one of the detectives, for people when they lie, they lie about the big things, but they flesh out their lies with the truth. There were certain elements of the varying stories that he told which kept coming back again and again and again. And these were the things that they came to see as most likely true. And I think these are the things that eventually enabled them to build the case against him. Well, and I suppose the challenge of of that extended interrogation session is that, you know, it's sort of a cardinal rule, right, of, 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 of questioning a subject that you want to always know the answer to the question before you ask it. And in yeah, this case... They didn't. They did, yeah. And I think, you know, the reason, my understanding of the reason why Lloyd Welsh kept talking to them was that he... First of all, he knew what he had done. He didn't know how much they knew. Yeah. 
And so in order to protect himself, he had to keep talking to them in order to learn what they knew so then he could make whatever adjustments and changes to his story that he felt would protect him. So I think that the detectives played upon that brilliantly, but the truth is that they didn't know the answers to the questions they were asking. Uh, they didn't even know from one session to the next how they were going to advance the case. So it was really, it was an enormous challenge and it was accomplished, I think, with tremendous creativity, yeah. determination, and, you know, they learned as they went. So so that that interview room, interrogation room, is probably the most uh, sort of sanitized setting in the book. The rest of it, and it gets really dark. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing with sort of dungeons where, you know, like basement dungeons where little kids are kept. We're dealing with some really disturbing sections of Appalachia. How, how we were just, I just heard one of the, uh, Katie was mentioning that, um, she sort of, if I, can I mention how you, uh, focus out of, out of work or how you sort of, you know, release your pressure valve by watching the real housewives of various settings. <laughs> but how do you, you know, having children and grandchildren and when you're so deep into a story like this for, for, you know, more, well over a year, how do you come home at night and sort of box it out and compartmentalize it and not let it Sort of. Well, it helps that all my children are grown <laughs> and live uh, elsewhere. Uh, I know that my wife got so sick of hearing Lloyd Welsh's voice because there were 70 plus hours of, <laughs> and I was watching all of it. And so she was just, it just creeped her out. Yeah. And, uh, and I watched it all. Uh, but I'm, I think, you know, to be honest, I have become over the years fairly clinical about the stories that I tell, whether I'm writing about a battle or drug dealers, or in this case, a terrible crime. Um, it doesn't uh, really enter my soul mm. in that way. It's more like this is the material, mm. and I'm focused on how can I best organize this, structure it, tell a story that will be compelling, and that will convey my understanding of what's happened. And, and that's enough, and it doesn't haunt me all that much. What haunts me is what happened to those poor little girls, not... not Lloyd Welsh and yeah, yeah. this story. Do you? Um, I was sort of, you know, looking at the catalog of your all of your previous work, and and this story, Doctor Dealer. Um, uh, 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 what was the? There was another uh, Finders Keepers, Finders right? Keepers, yeah. Some of these, some of these sort of smaller bore crime stories. Uh, you're in some ways sharing them with the world for the first time. You know, people. There's not. There's not. A, there's no sort of conventional wisdom built up around these. Versus stories like Black Hawk Down or like the, I guess the Aitola. Is is, are you reporting when you're when you're getting into the reporting of these kinds of stories versus the the woes that are already national or global news? Do you do you do you think about them in any way differently? Do you manage sources differently? Do you sort of think about how you're coming at information differently? I find them a lot more fun to do. Uh, because when you're writing about something that really nobody else has dug into or, or written about, you're, the, the coast is clear. I mean, you, you, you get to shape the story. And the people that you're interviewing and working with, I mean, I wrote a book about how Osama bin Laden was found and killed, and you've yeah. written about this too. And I waited a year and a half to interview President Obama and you know, got an hour and a half with him. Everybody in the world is writing about this. And so it's very difficult even to line up the interviews that you need in order to do the reporting to write the story. When you're dealing with people who are not written about all the time, uh, the, the challenge is slightly different, but it's certainly not hard for the most part to get people to talk to you. The challenge is more trying to make them understand what I'm trying to do yeah. so that uh, and I always tried to make sure that the people I'm writing about have a, at least a decent understanding of what I envision uh, I'm going to do with the story. Because I think that's the question that people have is why, what's this writer going to do? You know, yeah. are they going to make me look like an idiot? Or <laughs> And you don't want to, you don't want to sort of look like a self promoter by sending them writing samples in the beginning of the project, but you're no. like, please, just if you read this, you'll have a sense of how I, how I do this. But you know, I, I also to, to talk, you've mentioned some of the crime stories that I've written. Some people who are more familiar with books like Black Hawk Down and, and Killing Pablo and Way think of me as one kind of writer or reporter. And the fact is that, you know, I started out 
working for newspapers, writing crime stories. I've written crime stories my whole career. In the newspaper at the Philadelphia Inquirer, we used to have a Sunday editor named Ron Patel who loved to strip a crime story over top of the masthead of the Sunday paper. And this was a time when the Inquirer was going out to like a million, more than a million people every Sunday. So the reporters, myself and my colleagues, would compete every week going through the police blotters, looking for little nuggets that we could develop into stories that would get the Sunday strip. Nice. Ron called it the dirt ball strip. <laughs> and so we called those stories dirt balls. And, but they're, they're fascinating stories because they illuminate human behavior in extremis. Yeah. So where a crime has been committed, there's been like a tear in the fabric of society. Someone has broken the rules, something unexpected and awful has happened and that's inherently interesting and if you can spend the time to report it report it well and write about the people who are at the center of the story and get some deeper understanding of how and why these things happen sometimes it's like with finders keepers it's hilarious yeah. and sometimes it's terribly tragic but it's always fascinating well and i imagine too there's a uh some, I find there's a level of sincerity when you're when you're working when you're sort of interviewing people and working on a story about people who ha don't have much media exposure and you're not you're not sort of anticipating that the, you know there's no there's no uh, uh, PR apparatus surrounding them. Right. That sincerity, though, totally thrown out the window when you went and met Lloyd. You know, can you can you <laughs> like what 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 was what was yeah. what was that? How did you prepare for that? And well, I think, it, yeah. as you know, Nick, when you write about people, you want to meet them. Yeah. And and I I couldn't write about Lloyd Welsh, who's at the center of this story, without ever having met him. And very early on in the process, I wrote him a letter telling him what I was doing and saying, at some point, I would like to interview. You're obviously going to be a big part of this story. And he <laughs> wrote back that if I put $5,000 in his prison account, and if I agreed not to use his name <laughs> and you know, all these other things that, that he would agree to be interviewed. So, of course, I'm not going to do any of those things. So I wrote him back and I said, um, I'll come discuss terms with you, right? Which gave me what I wanted, which was a chance to sit down across from the guy, right. talk to him, form my own impression of him. And to be honest, after having watched him lie for a year and a half over 70 plus hours, I wasn't particularly interested in going back down that road myself, <laughs> yeah. you know, saying, why don't you tell me your version of events now, you know? And so, but what I did want is I wanted to size him up. I wanted to, um, and there were certain questions that I definitely wanted to ask him. And even though he had said he wouldn't answer any questions if I didn't pay him and all that stuff, I knew from watching him for so long, the guy loves to talk. Mm. So once I got there and started ask, talking to him, he would start answering questions, which is, in fact, what happened. And so one of the big questions I wanted to ask him was, why did you keep talking yeah. to the police? Right. I mean, <laughs> you, you basically, you did this to yourself, yeah. you know? And, and, of course, he lied to me. He told me, uh, well, I was forced to. Well, he doesn't know the work I've done right. in, in either the background. I know for damn well that he wasn't being forced <laughs> to be interviewed. In fact, he's enjoying himself in these interviews. And your wife certainly knows because she's been listening to the tapes. <laughs> <laughs> but I let you I mean, I gave him a chance and he answered that question. So I tell him, Lloyd, I'm not going to give you any money. And no, I'm definitely not going to promise not to use your name. And so he wrote, wrote me, um, threatening me uh, and telling me that his lawyers were going to come after me. They were going to you know, make me pay for mentioning to him and you know, I was going to really regret it and but a ended up saying but if you put three hundred dollars <laughs> in my prison account we'll talk about it further <laughs> and so his ultimatum was somewhat undercut by his uh, but the price had come way down yeah sure. I mean, one, one more session one more back and forth and we could have been down below 10 yeah. um the uh your, your 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 ultimate takeaway after sitting there with him though uh was one of, 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 you know, again, I know you say you try and approach this clinically, but one of, um, disgust, one of, 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 you know, what an intriguing mind to have sort of gone down all of these various sort of mazes with the detectives. Like what was your, what was your top line takeaway? Well, for me, I think the big thing was I couldn't imagine years ago when I was writing about this, who would do something like this? Um, 
you know, you would conjecture, was it one person? Could one person have kidnapped two little girls? I mean, that would just logistically, that would be hard, it seems to me. So if it was more than one person, what would that mean? Is this a, like a pedophilia group or, you know, th- th- it was just so weird. I couldn't imagine who would do such a thing. And I think that writing this book gave me a deep enough understanding of Lloyd that I can understand why he, somewhat, why he became the person he became and why he would do something like this. And, you know, the answers are in his family, this family where uh, sexual molestation was part of their culture, where parents molested children, uncles molested nieces, nephews, siblings experimented sexually with each other, cousins raped cousins, and none of this was ever reported to the police. This was all part of the family culture that he came out of. He was raped by his father when he was a child. Um, And so he was the product, in some ways, of the world that he came out of. And you turn a person like that loose on normal society in, in Kensington, Maryland, out by Wheaton Plaza. This is an upscale um, suburban community where the values and the lifestyle are so far out of Lloyd's grasp. By the time he was 18, he was living on the streets, you know, ingesting drugs, living hand to mouth, finding food from day to day. And he would go into a place like the Wheaton Plaza Mall, which is like a living commercial for the good life. Uh, where the products for sale are upscale products for well-to-do families that can afford to buy these things, big posters of happy families and people. And this world is one that is so distant from anything. He would have no idea how to even make the first step. And yet he lived right there in that community. And he, he wrote himself how angry he was, you know, as a young man. So you, you see the culture he came from, that bred this acceptance of sexual abuse of children. And you see this very disturbed, angry individual taking a lot of drugs. And you begin to see who would do something like this. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, there's there's the, a quote to close at the end of the book uh, from, from the Lloyd parents who say... The Lions parents. The Lions, Lions parents, sorry, 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 who say, we just want to go home. Yeah. And it suggests a level of closure that doesn't quite exist, right? Because... Well, it's a theme in the book. Yeah. I mean, the, I think one of the reasons that the Lion case was so shocking was that the community was uh, safe, considered a safe community. And, you know, people feel safe at home. That's one of the things that defines home for us. And I think one of the things that made this so shattering was so many people, myself included, grew up in communities like that, just like that. And that this could happen there really was uh, terrifying. And I think it changed the way parents raised their children. Um, And so that concept of home is permanently damaged by something like this. So John at the end, saying that he and Mary, at that point, they just wanted to go home, is almost a statement of of, uh, just so, it's so sad. You know, there's nothing that can redress what happened. There's nothing that can make up for what happened to them. Their home will never again, you know, be the same. But it's it's what they're left with. And some, some, to some extent, it's what we're all left with. Yeah. Um, why don't we, how are we doing? Yeah, let's uh, go to questions. So we have, uh, we can ask questions directly to Mark, and then also we have questions we can ask to the detectives if you have right. sort of case Mark specific. Mark and Katie, uh, I yeah. think, will we'll <laughs> answer questions if you like. Hi. Well, I, I wanted to thank you so much for all of your work. I'm a writer, too. I have a book out called Mental Health uh, INC, and your ability to tell stories so compellingly of different victims and outrageous incidents has been an inspiration to me, and I want to thank you so much. Well, you. I did want to ask you, the thing that is so striking, you are really one of the country's great nonfiction narrative writers. I don't think there's any question about it. How do you deal with telling a story 
of particular incidents where you really only have one primary witness and you don't have lots of audio and you have maybe secondary people only tell you a few things. The reason there's a lot of journalists who pay attention to you. I'm just asking where you don't have all this wonderful body of work to deal with, but you're telling stories and you got one primary person. Right. How do you deal with that issue? I first of all, judgment. I mean, right. you you need to use your judgment about how reliable the source you're, is the source you're dealing with. But the big the big thing is to make it transparent to the reader. This is where this information is coming from, and they right. can decide for themselves, you know, how reliable it is. Uh, you know, how much they, you know they choose to believe it. Uh, I used to get real kind of panicky when I had a situation where two people directly involved told completely opposite accounts of what happened. Uh, what do you do? Right. And what I learned to do is tell both accounts. Right. And because often what that does is it illustrates how either how confusing or how fraught, you know, a situation was. Readers are smart. You know, they can see, well, clearly these people are not telling the same story. There's a reason why they're not telling the same story. And your guess is as good as mine. If in the larger context of the story, very often those questions have obvious answers. But the, the, the big thing is, I think, to be straightforward with your readers and let them know exactly. Don't pretend you know more than you know. Well, thanks. And has the movie rights been bought yet on this? No, not yet. It's going to we'll make see. a hell of a movie. Well, oh, thanks. There's interest in the, um, just Just one point, though, you mentioned about sort of having the humility to admit that there are various accounts. You know, One thing you would said to me years ago, uh, which is, was a fabulous piece of advice because I was getting started and I was trying to figure out sort of, you know, what do you do? H- how do you actually sort of inject some voice into your stories? How do you how do you lead the reader in a way that doesn't you don't lay your opinion on the page, but that you direct the reader to those facts that you want that you think are the ones? And you said you made a comment, something along the lines of I, I don't know more about Somalia than anyone else, but I know more about the Battle of Mogadishu than anyone else. And 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 remember when you're finishing up your reporting and starting your writing, that you actually are, you know more about that particular event than anyone else. And therefore, tell the story as you understand it and not necessarily be beholden to, you know, you're obviously, you, you've interviewed 100 people or 200 people. You know, there's a, you've got a storyline in mind and then sort of use those sources to be able, that based on those sources, to be able to kind of guide the reader in a way that you think is, 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 yeah. is proper. I, so. I think the end product of all the work you do is that you arrive at your own independent understanding of the story. And I think you have to value that because in the case, let's say, of Black Hawk Down, there were hundreds of soldiers who were there in the streets fighting, but they only saw their small piece of the story. Who else has gone back for five years and interviewed hundreds of people and watched the video and pieced together the whole picture of what's going on? So I do have something valuable to offer but I think you have to be careful not to then assume that because you are the one with the overview that you now somehow know more than the guy, you know, about his own experience. So you have to balance those two things. Right, right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for writing the book and putting everything together from all the news stories that we heard. But I'm going to ask about the elephant in the room, and that is the tape recorder man. Why do you – and that he was very real. I know people who talked to him in Bowie. Mm-hmm. He was a real person. Yeah. Why don't you think that if he didn't commit the crime, why didn't he come forward and say that he didn't? And do you know who he was? Uh, at Mark and Katie might be able to answer. I know that, to my knowledge, no. Uh, we don't know who he was. Uh, there is fairly strong evidence that he was not um, involved in kidnapping the girls. Um, one of the eyewitnesses, it was a Danielle Shea, Danette, Danette Shea, well, one of the little girls who was there, uh, described him as be, and being surrounded by lots of people, by parents, by children, and talking to a lot of, of people. So for him to, in that crowded setting, have pulled two girls off by himself is highly unlikely. And I think if you read... Um, but it's the story, you'll see how convincing <clears throat> it is that, in fact, it was Lloyd who took those girls from the mall. Well, and, you know, I should also add, at the same time, this did not come out in the news reports back in 1975, but Danette Shea had given the police a description of a man who was stalking 
her and her friend and who was who was following little girls around the mall she described him and they they did a sketch of that person who looks exactly like Lloyd Welsh when he was 18 years old and that sadly connection was never made in 1975 mm. Sorry. thank you really interesting story and thank you to Mark and Katie uh, and in, in fact I'm going to take you up on your offer to at least address a question to Mark and Katie, or mostly to Mark and Katie. So, um, how Can you, sp you speak up just a little bit so people oh, okay. in the back? Yeah. You're, you're tall, so you're away. Yeah, right. I should know better. But. Thank you. Um, how much assistance did the Montgomery County police get, either in 1975 or, or any time since that point in time, from the FBI or any other sort of outside um, sources of help in the criminal justice system? Quite a bit. Um, the FBI was involved pretty much throughout the entire investigation. Um, they were very instrumental in helping us do several searches uh, prior to us getting to Bedford, Virginia. Um, we had an agent that was assigned with us uh, and worked hand-in-hand -in -hand with us for quite a while as well. And there were other jurisdictions um, <clears throat> throughout our role in the investigation. Katie and I traveled to 18 states to interview people and do search warrants and uh, other types of investigation. and. The law enforcement officers that we interacted with in all those jurisdictions could not have been more helpful and professional for us. Did the FBI take part in any of the interrogations, or is that I, I don't know enough about no. uh, the business? So. No, they were all all the mm. interrogations were done by us. Mm. Thank you. Well, before we go back real quick, were there any, uh, as a result of the investigative work that you all were doing in, in the Thaxton, is that how you pronounce it? Were there any uh, criminal cases that sort of flowed out of that from what you had either found or discovered that was not central to the Lions case, but that was sort of tangential? Um, there were cases throughout the country that came to our attention that had similarities uh, places where we suspected that Lloyd may have been at times during his life, but we were never able to certainly put him in those places. So we were never able to really pursue any other charges in those other jurisdictions. Yes. It is interesting that, that before the first interview session, uh, the Montgomery County Police had gone to the FBI to try to get uh, some advice on how to approach Lloyd. And they did a sort of a character profile of what to expect. And one of the things they s predicted was that this is someone who will shut up immediately uh, when he re when he realizes that he's a suspect. And they could not have been more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I wanted to thank you for tackling this case. I actually grew up in the area. And this case, I just won't ever forget it because I was in school at the time and my family and I were members at the swimming pool club that was right near Wheaton Plaza. Right. And malls at that time, you know, they were great places to hang out. And um, there was a great sense of you could just kind of throw your kids to the great outdoors or on neighborhood streets and there is just an incredible feeling of freedom and safety. And I clearly remember this case just, I don't know. It like, it turned a switch for me. So, Not just you. Yeah, thank you. A lot of people. I have two questions for you. Mm -hmm. The first is I was curious to know why you gave up newspaper reporting. And then my second question is, um, in the age of internet, of the internet, what makes uh, for a really good um, crime reporter? And then I wanted to also ask the detectives. Um, you know, there's a lot of press about how we can't trust the press, um, and I know that that happens between the press and law enforcement. So I was curious to know how Montgomery County Police. Um, was able to come to a place whereby they could work with you on this project. And also, if you could just touch on the Lululemon case that happened in Bethesda. I know that's a lot of questions. I'll, I'll let the detectives go first. Well, 
First, the Lululemon case, ironically, was my first day as a homicide detective. <laughs> so I, uh, I left that crime scene thinking, my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, is every day going to be like this? Fortunately, it's not. Uh, that was a really horrific case to be involved in. And some real good police work was done by my colleagues with that. Um, I forgot your first question for us. Tr the press. Oh, the press. Yeah. The pr yeah. So we fortunately have uh, established some real good relationships with members of the press. That uh, There's a, a real trust that we have with each other. And there are people that we can go to. And throughout this investigation, we utilize the press numerous times for tactical reasons. Um, we were on a wiretap uh, for several months and we would do things through the press to provoke people to talk on the phones. Uh, so, and, and there, the members of the press that we were close with helped us out in, in various ways with that. In terms of the book, um, I'm a big fan of Mark's. I've read a bunch of his books and so I was pretty excited when I heard he was interested in the story. And then when we met with him, instantly he earned our trust and we could see that he was genuinely interested in writing writing the story correctly. And that meant a lot to us. And he worked with us throughout the whole process. And we got to read drafts of the book and any input that we had, he took to heart and any corrections that we thought should be made, he made and he, he really nailed it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think your first question to me was why I left newspapers. And the answer is that largely the newspapers left me. <laughs> uh, you know, at a certain point in my career, I was a senior reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. The newspaper was cutting back. They no longer wanted to pay me uh, what they paid me. And this is a tragedy. And it not just, it fr thankfully, was not a tragedy in my life because I had kind of outgrown newspapers anyway at that point. I had a career writing books and magazine stories. But for many of my colleagues uh, who weren't in a position to step immediately into that, it was devastating for them because the newspaper just basically started laying off or buying out, you know, all of their senior reporters and staff. And it just decimated a lot of really great newspapers all over the country. So that was, you know, I think the reason why, and I still do occasionally write pieces, like I'm working on a piece for the New York Times right now. Uh, the, the elements that make a reporter and a story have never changed. Uh, a great story is a great story. And a, a great reporter is somebody who um, works hard, finds the people who are directly involved in the story, finds source material, and really does their homework before they tell a story. I used to tell my students, one of whom is here tonight, that if you want to attract attention to yourself as a reporter, tell people something new. Tell them something that they haven't heard before. 99% of what is out there on the internet or even on all these shows on cable TV are people repeating and speculating about stuff that they've read elsewhere. Very, very few people actually go out and do their own reporting. If you want to know, you know, who are the people who are marching up through Mexico to get in the United States, you can listen to pundits on TV saying that they're this thing or that thing. I'm interested in the reporter who goes down to Mexico and walks up the road with those people and talks to them and tells me something that I didn't know, you know, and that that's what makes a good reporter. Speaking of good reporters. <laughs> Uh, Mark, you, you spoke so well in the beginning about, you know, being a young reporter and having this disconnect in a way, you know, you were on a great story and not fully realizing the lives of the people in that story, which I think is common. So were you aware of how your interviewing and your writing changed as you sort of grew up as a human being and had a greater appreciation for those lives? I'm oh, sure. without question. I mean, I, I, and this was really a formative experience for me. John and Mary Lyon are lovely people. Um, if you meet them, I haven't seen them in many, many years, but I remember them vividly. <clears throat> and I admired them. And I, I just felt it was just so terrible what they were going through. Uh, anytime I, I write about anybody, and this has been true through most of my career, I, I want to meet those people. 
You know, I want to understand those people. I want the story that I write to accurately reflect who they are and what their experience has been. And that's always driven me to leave the newsroom, go out, find the people that I'm writing about. And that is probably the most valuable lesson that I learned from covering the story. And it's served me very well for a long time. Okay, and, and I, as I recall these events, this was the most intensive police investigation in this area before 9-11 even, hmm. even to the extent of there being a traffic stop out here at right. Connecticut and Nebraska. Maybe the Malvo case, the Beltway well, sniper, that was a pretty big that, one. That's, yeah. that's after 9-11, yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how victims' counseling and victims' assistance has evolved during this, as a result of this case? John Lyon was the folk music guy on WMAL radio, and people knew him. Yeah. And, about and you know what, like you. what John has done since he retired is become a counselor for victims in the court system in Montgomery County. This is the sort of man he is. And so he's taken his personal tragedy and used it to try to help other people um, for many years now. It's one of the reasons why I think he's so uh, respected and admired by the Montgomery County Police and the court, the prosecutors and the you know people who work in that courthouse all know him. Uh, so I, you know, I really don't know in a larger sense how things like that have changed, but I imagine there's certainly much more emphasis given to counseling people who have been through these tragedies. And I know police departments are a lot more sensitive about uh, victims of, of crimes. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the book. You're welcome. Thank you to the detectives. Um, Lloyd lived in a foster program. I was his counselor for the years leading up to this. Yeah. I'm sorry you didn't find us. No, I am too. Because Lloyd belonged in prison, unfortunately. So thank you. You all may have been the people I spoke to. You found us years later. And the one thing I want to say, this is painful. First of all, I'm sorry to society that somehow I didn't do my job oh, for crying to out stop loud. this. Yeah. yeah, but you couldn't have known. But you, ha yeah. you have to keep looking for whoever helped him because Lloyd could not have completed this by himself. He could not have done it alone. He needed to tell everybody. He stole my pocket money from me the first time I was ever in the house. And he let it be clear. He, I mean, we all knew. Yeah. Lloyd ripped off my $15 of pocket money. <laughs> he would tell, he will tell the truth. Buried in a bunch of crap. But he was not alone. He could not have pulled this off alone. Yeah. There's no way Lloyd Welch could have done this alone. Yeah. He had help. He had a lot of help. And I hope you're still looking for the people who helped him do that. Because at, they need to be found. At the end of this uh, book, I asked Mark and Katie and Dave and Chris, who worked on this case for so long, what their theory was of exactly what happened. And in most cases, in all cases, they agree with you that he could not have done this all by he himself. Could not, but what was interesting is that he each couldn't of, drive. Yeah. He had no driver's license. He could not read or write. Yeah. He was a wild child. A feral individual. You had yeah. to take him and start him over. And it was very difficult. You have a very tragic and personal perspective on, on all this. Thank you for writing the book. There was closure there. Oh. I mean, I never knew what happened to him. You're, you're very welcome, man. I'm glad it helped. But it is interesting that these th the theories are all different of what happened. So there still are a lot of questions about how this happened, who all w was involved. And, uh, well, I hope that it's still an open case. Well, maybe this book will attract a lot of attention to it, and maybe it'll help keep that, those questions alive. Maybe we can speak to the police. The investigators, you probably want to be done with it. I don't blame you. I want to be done with it, too. Did you want to answer it, Mark? Do you want to talk about it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you for a job well done. He belongs in prison. No, I sorry, don't think he's sorry. going anywhere. Thank you. Unless he lives to be the oldest man alive. Uh, he's in jail till he dies.
Oh, sorry. Well, I would like to thank everyone for their tenacious work on this, both the police and, and you. Uh, I do want to add a little nugget to it. My sister was abducted by him. She's sitting here. She yeah. went to the police. He actually took my sister and her friend out of the Wheaton Plaza Mall. I think the police know this. Uh, very interesting, and you all were wonderful. Yeah, I wrote about this in the book. Too. Right. Yeah. Uh, took her out of the mall, uh, and she, they got into a car with him. I, don't, I still don't understand why you got in there after my mother told you never to do that. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, because you, you were a little girl, and they were able to escape from the car. Right. They had the good sense yeah. to yeah. jump out of the car right. at a certain point. And yeah. then what happened, what was very odd to us, is that you weren't, we don't think she was believed initially. She was just a little girl. And then when the Washington Post would write about it, like every 10 years or so, uh, Valerie would go back and uh, try to make contact. And eventually, you were able to email. Uh, and the police then picked up on the email, contacted her, and she was able to pick out his picture from the, I guess, the lineup of pictures. And of course, if you know his picture, you know you don't, never forget that face. Right. This so, is yeah. a really interesting mm -hmm. and obviously, right. thankfully, mm -hmm. not a terribly tragic event, but, but a really important one. And it shows that, I think, not just this case, but a number of others, that Lloyd was getting mm -hmm. better, that he was practicing uh, before he succeeded in taking the Lions girls. But he could do it by himself. He, if he was alone acting and got them into the car by himself, what happened after that is another story. Right. But he was able to, do in some way, get little girls into a car. Two yeah. of them. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Amazing. I was just wondering, um, uh, you were talking about the FBI helping, and if they had done a profile, or if that was something that was done at the time back then, and if there was any accuracy when you looked at that and then ultimately? No, they never did a, a behavioral profile other than the interrogation that uh, Mark mentioned. They did a pretty extensive one at that point, but it was geared towards the interrogation and what we could expect from him. And they, they told us that if he spoke to us once, that would be the last time. So. <laughs> and, and you know to be fair that's actually a, a, probably a fairly reasonable assessment of what to expect because he had every reason in the world and should have in his own self-interest shut up and the fact that he didn't is just speaks to how what a bizarre character Lloyd is thank you Th thank you all thank you all this is an amazing thanks so much <laughs> awesome. yeah.